In this video, we're going to look at PET scanning. And in PET scanning, we talk about radio traces and annihilation, as well as how to detect gamma radiation. But remember to subscribe to the Physics Tips for Cambridge Students YouTube channel and hit the bell notification so that you get alerted to future videos. Without much further ado, let's get started. Now, PET scanning. Before we start, we're going to look at objectives. In the objectives, we're going to look at radio tracers. So you should be able to understand that a tracer is a substance containing radioactive nuclei that can be introduced into the body and that can be absorbed by the tissue being studied. Also recall that a tracer that decays by beta plus decay is used in positron emission tomography, which is PET scanning. We're also going to look at annihilation. And the objectives under annihilation are to understand that annihilation occurs when a particle interacts with its antiparticle and that mass energy and momentum are conserved in the process. Also, explain that in PET scanning, positrons emitted by the decay of the tracer annihilate when they interact with electrons in the tissue, producing a pair of gamma ray photons traveling in opposite directions. Also, be able to calculate the energy of the gamma ray photons emitted during the annihilation of an electron positron pair. Understand that the gamma ray photons from an annihilation event travel outside the body and can be detected, and an image of the tracer concentration in the tissue can be created by processing the arrival times of the gamma ray photons. Now, so we're going to lay a background to this positron emission tomography. Positron emission tomography, PET scan, it looks at the patient from the inside, unlike X-ray and ultrasound or other methods of scanning which look from the outside. In this one, a patient is going to be injected with a glucose-based radio tracer which is then absorbed by the body and then the analysis is going to be done. The uses are in investigating, diagnosing, and monitoring treatment of cancers, heart disease and gastrointestinal disorders, as well as brain function. PET scans are able to pinpoint molecular activity at that particular point where the cancer is. The patient is laid right here on the bed and then made to get in. So you see, this is the detector which is in the form of a donut shape and the patient is going to be in the radio tracers. A small amount of tracer which is called a radio tracer is injected into a vein and travels around the body and is absorbed by organs and tissues. Radiation from organs or tissues is used to produce an image. What is a radio tracer? A radio tracer is a substance that contains a radioactive material that is attached to a natural chemical, e.g. glucose. But radio tracers that are used consist of a substance that decays by emitting beta plus particle that is a positron. An example of a radio tracer is fluorodeoxyglucose, FDG, coming from fluorodeoxyglucose. Now the structure of fluorodeoxyglucose is as shown here. As you can see, the whole structure is like glucose, but then one of the OH- has been removed and substituted by a fluorine atom, hence the name deoxy. The F18, which is the fluorine 18 in that molecule, is produced when oxygen 18 nuclei are bombarded by protons to form the F18 isotope. A neutron and a gamma ray are also formed in the process. The equation is as follows. So we've got the oxygen 18 here. And then it's going to be bombarded by a proton to produce the fluorine 18, a neutron, and a gamma ray. Now the isotope fluorine 18 is a half-life of just under two hours, which means that the patient is not subjected to radiation for a long period of time. However, this also means that the radio tracer has to be freshly prepared to be most effective. Otherwise, if you delay, then it's going to decay by the time it gets into the body. So it has to be freshly prepared. Now, F18 isotope then decays by beta plus decay to form oxygen 18 again, according to this equation. So F18, there's 9 at the bottom there, to produce oxygen 18, so suppose we 18, 8 there, plus the positron. Let's look at the advantages of using a glucose-based tracer. It is taken up at different rates by the different organs or tissue. So cancer cells absorb more glucose than the surrounding tissue 
and emit radiation at a greater rate. So it's very easy to identify the position where the cancer is or the tumor is. Now we're going to talk about annihilation. When a positron is emitted from a tracer in the body, it travels less than a millimeter before it collides with an electron. The positron and the electron will annihilate and their mass becomes pure energy in the form of two gamma rays which move apart in opposite directions. Definition of annihilation. This is when a particle meets its equivalent antiparticle and they both get destroyed. Their mass is converted into energy. As with all collisions, the mass energy is conserved as well as the momentum. Is right, this is a question. It says, suggest the reason why in PET scanning, it is important that the positron meets an electron within a very short distance from its point of emission. This is because the point of production of the pair of gamma rays is the position of the annihilation of the positron-electron pair. So the closer this is to where the original positron is emitted, the better the resolution of the image. So this is the diagram that takes place. So this is a positron coming in to meet an electron just less than a millimeter from when it is produced. Then the annihilation process is going to take place and then two gamma rays are going to be formed moving in opposite directions. You can see the angle is 180 degrees from the other one. So this is a gamma photon going this direction, gamma photon going in the opposite direction and the equation is given like that. The initial kinetic energy of the positron is small in other words, it is negligible compared to their rest mass energy. Hence, the gamma ray photons have a specific energy and a specific frequency, not a range. The energy of a photon is given by E is equal to HF. From this, E is equal to HC over lambda. And we know from the de Broglie relationship that P is equal to H over lambda. This is from quantum physics. So this means that if you divide by C, this side here, you're going to get P. So we can say E is equal to P times C. Therefore, P will be equal to E over C. So that's where it comes from. Example, explain why the gamma rays produced in positron-electron annihilation must travel at 180 degrees to each other. Also, calculate the energy released when a positron and an electron annihilate Calculate the frequency of the gamma rays produced. Calculate the momentum of one of the gamma rays emitted as well. Now the answer to the first one, why the gamma rays produced in positron electron annihilation must travel at 180 degrees to each other. This is because momentum is conserved in the reaction. So the initial momentum of the positron, which is nearly zero, thus each photon must have the same magnitude momentum but in opposite directions to maintain a total momentum of zero. For the second one, calculate the energy released when a positron and an electron annihilate. From the Einstein's mass energy equation, E is equal to mc squared. So we can say that two times because we're going to form a positron and an electron, they've got the same mass. So we're going to say 2 times 9.1 times 10 to the power of minus 31 times C squared, which is going to be that. So that's the total energy that's going to be produced. 1.6 times 10 to the power of minus 13 joules. Then the next question says, calculate the frequency of the gamma rays that are produced. Now we know from the Einstein equation again, E is equal to HF. This is the energy of a photon. Finding the frequency, you divide the energy by Planck's constant. The energy is 0 0.8 times 10 to the power of minus 13 joules. And Planck's constant is 6.63 times 10 to the power of minus 34. Now, the reason why we've used 0 0.8 here is because this is the energy for two of the gamma ray photons. So to get for one, because the question now wants just for one, you've got to divide that by two. So that is why here we've used 0 0.8. So the frequency of each of the gamma photons is going to be 1.2 times 10 to the power of 20 hertz. Then lastly, says that calculate the momentum of one of the gamma rays emitted. So we're going to use our relation that we found here. 
momentum is equal to energy over the speed of electromagnetic radiation. So momentum we've got E over C, which is 0 0.8 times 10 to the power of minus 13, divided by C, giving you 2.7 times 10 to the power of minus 22 newton seconds. We're going to end the video by talking about detectors of gamma radiation. Now, the high-energy gamma photons penetrate the body easily because, remember, they've got the shortest wavelength and they've got the highest frequency. So their penetrating ability is the highest. They are easily detected by circular ring detectors simultaneously. So we have the positron meeting the electron there and then the annihilation takes place. The gamma photon goes this way, another gamma photon goes this way. And the one that goes this way is going to be detected on this ring detector that we're talking about. And the other one going this way is going to be detected. Now by comparing the time delay, we are going to find exactly the position where the annihilation is taking place. The circular ring detectors detect them simultaneously, that is the two gamma ray photons. Now this is called coincidence detection, that is within 5 to 10 nanoseconds. The line that is drawn, this line between the two simultaneously activated gamma detectors is called the line of response. Now the gamma rays that do not arrive in pairs like these ones here, they are ignored in the process. These gamma rays will be due to scattering or random nature of interactions. So other simultaneous detectors can be detected also at different angles. So the image is going to be very complex, so it requires a high-powered computer to do the calculations there and find the position of the source, that is, of the tumor, that is at the intersection of all the lines of response. A 3D image is then formed by a computer using the tomography just like in CT scanning from the slices that will be formed. A disease can then be identified in its early stage, thus increasing the chances of successful treatment. Now, PET scan can also be used to track a patient's immediate and ongoing response to treatment, one of the advantages there. So that's how an image is formed, when all the lines of response in all different angles are summed up together to form a 3D image. Now, when the gamma rays reach and at the ends there, there is going to be light that's going to be emitted. Scintillations of light are going to be formed, so that becomes easy to detect. Now, we're going to look at an example. This will be our last example before I end this video. Positron emission tomography makes use of a tracer containing a radioactive material that decays by positron emission. State what is meant by a tracer. So as we have said that a tracer is a substance that is introduced into the body that is absorbed by tissues that are being studied. State the name of the particles that are emitted from the body and detected by the detectors during PET scanning. These are the gamma ray photons. Explain how the particles in A2 are created from positrons. Now here the positrons interact with electrons that is from the tissue. So like I said the positron is emitted from the decay of the fluorine 18. Then meet with an electron right there, very close, and then the annihilation occurs. So a positron being an antiparticle or antimatter for an electron, annihilation takes place. So matter is going to be turned into energy. That's when these gamma ray photons are produced. Then the last question, positrons can be artificially created by a process in the laboratory that is the reverse of the process in B. So the reverse of annihilation is pair production. This process creates both a positron and an electron moving at the same speed in opposite directions. Suggest why two of the particles in A2 are needed to create one positron. Combined momentum of electron and positron should be zero because they approach each other. The positron and the electron have the same mass. And since they are moving in opposite directions, their resultant momentum is supposed to be zero. So the photons that are going to be produced have momentum. So they must also be in opposite directions so that we conserve momentum. This is what's going to take place. So right there, that's where you have your annihilation taking place. And the line of response is then made there. Then this information is going to send to this processing unit to a sinogram with least more data and then to a high-powered computer and the 3D image is constructed.
So this is a person that has been scanned. Like I said that the cancers love glucose a lot. So they're going to get more of the glucose and that's where you're going to see more of this on the image. Now we're going to look at the summary. So in a PT scan, the tracer emits positrons. When a particle and an antiparticle meet, they annihilate. Then in an annihilation event, both momentum and mass energy are conserved. Then the energy of a gamma ray, supposed to be gamma ray here. So energy of a gamma ray photon is given by the formula E is equal to HF and the momentum P is equal to E over C. Right, so this marks the end of the video. Please don't forget to like, share, as well as to comment. Subscribe to the Physics Tips for Cambridge Students YouTube channel. Signing out.